Thank you, everybody. This is a first for me, my first time at Camp Sunshine. But it's also a first for all of us interested in Fanconi and Nimi because we, there's been sufficient progress in understanding the disease to be able to visualize many different approaches to drug discovery. You know better than most that Fanconi anemia is a disease where the patient is always at risk for something. The diseases of most concern, I'm happy to tell you, are firmly in the sights of some of the best investigators around the country and around the world. So I'll be talking about drug strategies that kill squamous carcinoma cells, a drug strategy that will protect normal um, squamous epithelia during radiation treatment, strategies as uh, Laura and Rabin and Alan uh, began to introduce today strategies that help preserve stem cells in the bone marrow, keep, keep bone marrow cells alive. And finally, a strategy that even I, and I've been doing cell and molecular biology for a long time, blink my eyes in astonishment at, but we can visualize a home run strategy or maybe a score <laughs> strategy where we can now screen for a small molecule that can fix the pathway. Hasn't happened yet, we don't have that drug, but we can visualize the screen. The progress you'll see, uh, I think folks in this room can take uh, some responsibility for and pride in. 25 years ago, when Fanconi anemia was just becoming appreciated, as a very severe disease, we didn't know the genes. Basic science community responded by saying, well, if you support us, we can figure out what those genes are. We'll clone the genes. It took, we're still discovering Fanconi genes, but fortunately we know what most of them are. The genes have led us to the pathway. You, Dr. DeAndrea described the pathway the pathway is now leading us to understand the way the pathway interacts with the cell and how Fanconi cells interact uh, in combination in the body, basically the physiology of how Fanconi affects the whole individual. Well, once we get to the level of physiology, suddenly we're at a plateau where we can really understand and predict possible drugs. That's what I'll be telling you. So, much of, the, much of the progress here is jointly coming from a belief that basic science will eventually deliver. I think it is delivering, it's just taken us longer than any of us would have wished. But let's uh, look at some of the details. In my slides, I've tried to touch on uh, research work and tell you the source. In many cases, work uh, is introduced by Laura, has been sponsored by the Research Fund, in other cases, investigators whom, who received uh, an initial grant from the research fund have gone on to get support from um, other sources, principally the National Institutes of Health. So we can be quite pleased that uh, people we support go on to do highly competitive, very valuable research, and often bring in grants that are worth five or 10 times the amount of seed money that comes from the research fund. But we'll be talking about oral cancer, as I say, killing cancer cells with minimal damage to non-tumor tissue. Many investigators are pursuing the aldehyde hypothesis, which we've heard about today, or other ideas as to how to preserve stem cells in the bone marrow, touch on a novel approach and I'll say something about clinical trials. Fortunately, there are clinical trials. You heard about one from Jennifer Adair yesterday, and we just heard about one from Rabin. There will be more clinical trials coming very soon, and you folks will be making decisions about whether or not to participate. So I will be concluding with a slide just to keep some ideas in mind about clinical trials uh, as you ponder them. Through, uh, two, three, four years ago, we weren't talking about clinical trials, but now we are. 
It will be helpful, I think, also to learn how chemists and medicinal chemists and drug companies think about small molecules or drugs. So here's a glossary. The way they use these words may not be the same as how you use these words. A hit, a hit, nothing to do with baseball. It's a particular compound that has significant activity in an assay. It is if uh, it's really good, it may turn into a lead, which is a compound that is active in one or more assays, yet is acceptably low in undesirable activities. A lead might grow up to become a drug candidate. It's a lead, often with little changes that improve its activity or modify its bioavailability, suitable for further testing, toxicity testing, in animals or phase one trials in people. Please recall from Rabin's slide that most uh, the principal value, the principal need in the clinical trial process is establishing safety. That's all phase one trials are about. Is it safe? Phase two trials, is it safe? Can we begin to see any evidence of efficacy? But it's still principally safety. Phase three trials approach questions of dosing. They do look for evidence of efficacy, but it's also a safety trial. So this is all worth keeping in mind. Many drug candidates fail because they simply can't achieve the right concentration in the right compartment in the body. The bone marrow is a compartment. So if a drug is bioavailable, it means that it can achieve a useful concentration in the same compartment, maybe the, a cell or some organ, as its target. If it doesn't make it to the right compartment, it's useless. We think about these uh, issues with the phrase therapeutic index, which is simply the ratio of good things that a drug might do to the bad things that it might, that it might cause. Mechanism-based toxicity summarizes all the bad things a drug, when acting on its target, might actually, uh, might actually cause. And this leads to dose-limiting side effects. Examples might be drugs that uh, gain act, get into the bloodstream, but are filtered out in the liver and are toxic to the liver. So before they can do anything good, they may cause damage elsewhere. We, of course, want to understand the basis for a therapeutic index. We want to avoid mechanism-based toxicity. The final one, which is a little hard to read, is uh, sort of a joke. When medicinal chemists get together, they like to believe that the diversity of small molecules or compounds that might be drugs is essentially unlimited. So they will use the phrase n-dimensional shape space. So keep them away from liquor. <laughs> so the research fund is taking head and neck cancer quite seriously. And uh, let me just briefly zoom through three, three recent results from three labs we're supporting focused on squamous cell carcinoma. First, investigator at the University of Colorado, Robert Sclafani, he tested, he put resveratrol which many of us know, especially if you remember from Laura's presentation, is a natural product available from red grapes and other natural sources. Peanuts also have some. You just dump resveratrol on cell lines derived from squamous cell carcinoma. It kills the cells. He's pursuing that idea. He's now found with a variety of uh, different cell lines that he gets even better activity by adding a second drug, a two-drug combination. This is a theme that's beginning to emerge. Many investigators are pursuing not one, but a second drug that acts by a complementary mechanism. It's a long history in drug development of synergies like this. The hope from Dr. Scalfani's work is to identify drug targets that might synergize with each other to prevent or control squamous cell carcinoma. We shall see, our fingers are crossed. Another investigator we did support in the past is a radiation oncologist at the University of Chicago by the name of Michael Spioto. 
He knows that we're concerned about papillomavirus. He knows that some squamous cell carcinomas also show evidence of papillomavirus sequences or footprints. He wonders, could the papillomavirus be uh, uh, contributing to the cancer? In his research that he proposed to us, he said, let's target the papillomavirus genes that disrupt cell cycle control and act like oncogenes. And he has some remarkable data. I'll show you on the next slide. Um, don't want to go through all the formalism because it's easy to explain with some data he sent us a couple of months ago. In this study, he took advantage of the fact that having cloned genes, understanding the molecular biology of papillomaviruses, and being quite skilled at developing mouse models, somewhat like the models that Dr. De Dr. DeAndrea described, you can create a mouse where you can turn on a squamous cell carcinoma with a genetic switch. You can leave it off, or you can turn it on. And in this case, the switch is activated by a one compound, and after, a, if uh, you turn the switch on, about 10 days after you turn on the switch, tumors start to appear, and if mice are treated with the solvent of the drugs, they get quite large quite quickly, and if left alone, they'd kill the animal. But he's tested two drugs, singly and in combination. One drug called RAP, op open circles, so the tumors are launched, and RAP itself, standing for rapamycin, leads to a delay in the emergence of the tumors. A second drug called IMA, with the black squares after the tumors are larged, launched, IMA uh, doesn't have much of an effect by itself. So the tumors still grow almost as quickly as the, uh, the control with no drug at all. But two drugs together, you can see where this is going, are the open squares at the bottom. Nothing, 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 and only, uh, only at three to four weeks do tiny little tumors appear. This is the sort of science we, we're thrilled to see. Both RAP, which stands for rapamycin, and IMA, which stands for imatinab, are approved therapeutics for other indications. So here's the theme. Approved, we now know enough to make reasonably rational choices from approved drugs and bring them to bear on FA problems. And this one uh, is quite relevant. Squamous cell carcinoma these days is treated by a technique from the last century, radiation. And unfortunately, it's one of the few options that's approved and is regularly practiced. Fanconi patients, of course, have, have serious problems. We know that they, can't, they don't tolerate radiation very well. And uh, we know that there's no other real pharmacologic um, option for them. We were quite pleased to receive proposals from another radiation oncologist, Joel Greenberger at the University of Pittsburgh, who very, uh, for years has been testing a pharmacologic treatment that somehow, almost by magic, can seems to be able to protect normal cells from radiation, but still allow tumors to die. We had trouble understanding this when we read his grant. So by reading his papers and finally sitting down to him where, when he couldn't squirm away at a meeting and talk to him, we think we understand what's on the next slide. So in this model system, uh, uh, rats, I think, you heard of rats? Rats, I think, because they're big, you can work on them, are given substantial doses of radiation. You're going nowhere to Yo, excuse me, mice, FANC D2 mice. So in this case, the, uh, the organ was the tongue of mice that are deficient in FANC D2. And what the slides show, and we can really focus on these two panels, 
is that in FANG D2 animals, given a whopping dose of radiation, 28 grays, uh, the uh, animal shows severe lesions and severe blistering in the oral cavity. So these disruptions are where epithelial cells have been killed by the radiation, similar to the amount of radiation that would be used therapeutically to kill a squamous cell carcinoma. In the experimental group of animals, he treated first with a compound that is supposed to protect the cells from radiation. And lo and behold, they look terrific. The tongue has these little hairs growing in the epithelium, the squamous cell epithelium, and it looks virtually normal. It looks just as good as plus plus cells. Recent work, which we'll hear from Dr. Greenberger's laboratory, has extended this work now to a setting where he also will induce squamous cell carcinomas to really test this idea that if you, you can give the radioprotective compound and demonstrate that a subsequent dose of radiation will kill the tumor, yet spare the normal cells. So we're very encouraged by this, and uh, we hope to learn more about it at the symposium. Join us at the symposium. You can hear about it too. This is remarkable, but it shows the uh, the astonishing creativity of the scientific minds that are being attracted to Fanconi anemia research. And that, of course, comes through the fund, and it comes from you. Laura introduced uh, Michael Garbati's work, and we just heard from Alan DeAndrea earlier today. And Ray Monat is a name familiar to some of you who come to the symposium. And let me touch on some highlights from their work here the focus is not squamous cell carcinoma, but bone marrow health. Let's keep stem cells alive and prevent them from dying from whatever it is is killing them. So Michael Garbati, working in the lab of Grover Bagby, is using a variety of different chemical compounds, some of which are in phase one trials for other indications. This compound is in a phase one trial for ovarian cancer. Other compounds are research compounds and may never, be a may never be drugs, but these test the idea, uh, an aspect of the aldehyde idea, that uh, it may be possible to, by, uh, by preventing, as, as Laura said, the cytokine, it may be possible to intervene in the pathway of aldehyde damage uh, by modulating cytokine levels. This is a typical good modern research program, but I show it to you because it shows uh, an increasingly sophisticated knowledge of how the Fanconi pathway interacts with other signaling pathways, the MAP kinase pathway, for example, and integrates it with what we've been learning about the general interaction with the physiology of the body. Maybe aldehydes are setting up a terrible stress in stem cells. Therefore, we should learn what the natural ways are to enhance aldehyde dehydrogenase activity. That's what these compounds are doing. And we're hoping that if one reason aldehydes uh, themselves are active could be because the dehydrogenases, the natural recycling enzymes, may be suppressed because of cytokines. That's a hope. We're funding it. We can't wait to see the result. Alan DeAndrea this morning did not talk about some collaborative work with uh, investigators at um, OHSU or the VA in Oregon uh, as initially supported by the research fund, but subsequently supported by the NIH, just what we like to happen. We gave them some seed money and they quintupled it by going to the NIH. They found through screening several compounds that looked promising in cell-based assays. Tremulasin is a molecule that looks a little bit like aspirin, but it looked encouraging, it may be we have less interest in it uh, only because better compounds seem to be emerging. Alan mentioned cysteamine. This is another aldehyde scavenger. And just to nail down a point 
from a question this morning, aldehyde, Alan called these aldehyde sponges, I call them scavengers. I think what we both mean is that they chemically, permanently inactivate aldehydes through uh, new chemical bonds. They kill the aldehydes. Even more exciting is a drug that's distantly derived from resveratrol. So in fact, as an aside, resveratrol is a big molecule, and a chemist would describe it as having a great many pharmacophores, or little re drug, small drug-like regions that may be active in a variety of assays, sometimes um, uh, almost with, diet, with opposed activities. Uh, a life-prolonging effect in worms and in mice from resveratrol led people to cut up the resveratrol molecule, and a fragment of resveratrol called SIRT1 seems to be able to enhance or boost the levels of stem cells in uh, D2-deficient mice. This is work that Marcus Grumpy has been doing. He's seen no side effects so far. CERT1 is being pursued by GlaxoSmithKline for other indications. Our fingers are crossed that it may be, one, anti-inflammatory, and two, it may help preserve the number of stem cells, and it looks safe so far. So uh, we hope Marcus continues to study that. Uh, there may not be time to talk about oxymethylone, but I do want to stress that there are, this is a very exciting compound, and it goes right to one of the most uh, fundamental concerns preserving stem cells right now in, in today's, today's patients. Uh, another investigator who's a friend of the research fund is Ray Monat, and Ray has received a, a uh, grant to pursue additional aldehyde scavengers, one of which is an approved drug. I should say a very widely approved drug. And Ray asked me not to name it, but it's uh, safe. And in the setting of FA, we think it would also be a chemical inactivator of aldehydes. He's doing this with a, a team which includes Akiko Shimamura, who some of you know from the symposium, who trained with Alan D'Andrea, a chemist, Jim Swenberg, who can truly figure out exactly what aldehydes are doing to DNA. Do they bind to DNA? Do they add themselves chemically to DNA? If so, which aldehyde and what does it hit? What's the damage to the nearest atom? So we're going to find that out, hopefully, within six months. Carrie Fowler is also part of this team. You know his work. Raise your hand if you know what Tadalafil is. I don't see many hands up. What if I called it by its regular commercial name, Cialis? Was, <laughs> I'm, hearing, I'm hearing the functional equivalent of hands going up. His group, his group did the medicinal chemistry to turn a hit into a lead into a drug. He is a wizard. He is fabulously smart. We're very lucky to have him as part of this team. Uh, Carrie and I came up with some of the suggestions to give to Ray, and I'm, so, I'm quite thrilled to be part of this. Even though I don't have access to a drug lab anymore, I told Ray I'd bring snacks to all the group meetings if they let me come. <laughs> so, the aldehyde scavenger idea is being tested by many labs across the country. If this, is, if this idea has legs, we're going to know very soon, within the year. A home run. I hear you saying, if you scientists guys are so smart, why can't you just find a drug that fixes the pathway? Andrew Deans, who the research fund is supporting, gives us a mental image of how to do that. Andrew has figured out how to make all of the gene products that you know because of their letters are usually associated with a deficient gene. Andrew has figured out how to make all of these proteins, A, B, C, the early complex 
in a concerted way, in a concerted tube, in a concerted fashion, so that they can be, so that they are biochemically authentic and enzymatically active. If that's the case, Andrew said, we know if you leave one out, the pathway isn't functional. And he was smart enough to make the next step and said, well, if you leave one out, let it be the basis for a drug screen. If you leave one out, the, path, the group doesn't come together. But if you present these two, this pattern of proteins, submit it to a high-throughput drug screening assay, you can look for the red dot. That's what the big pharma companies do all the time, and Andrew has given us a way to visualize this experiment and begin to do it. This is why when medicinal chemists say, well, there must be a drug out there, there is n-dimensional shape space after all, maybe they're right. In fact, what we do, we're optimistic that Andrew will be able to uh, set up a screen that other, and he's willing to share this, which is a condition of receiving a grant from the research fund. We're, uh, we're sponsoring the work that will lead to a high throughput screen that could identify a drug that fixes the pathway. Delighted to tell you about that. This also took some pondering to think through. I tell it to you now, it seems obvious. It did not seem so obvious a couple of years ago. Uh, Rabin has just talked about the uh, N-acetylcysteine uh, trial. I have a couple of slides that can emphasize a bit more about aldehyde biochemistry and another slide about Aldea pharmaceuticals. I think Alan already showed the fundamentals of aldehyde metabolism, uh, kind of unrelated to FA, but very important all the time in people who in anyone who consumes alcohol, uh, two key recycling enzymes detoxify ethanol. Ethanol itself is neurotoxic, and if you don't get rid of alcohol and tr turn it into a molecule that you can eliminate rapidly in your urine, like um, acetate or acetic acid, uh, you're in trouble. But fortunately, we have the enzymes. The first enzyme in the recycling pathway is alcohol dehydrogenase. It goes from alcohol to an aldehyde, in this case, acid aldehyde, if the starting material is ethanol. And this, of course, in the presence of ALDH2, uh, will almost instantly gets turned into acetate. Highly soluble in water, gets into urine, and you get rid of it. The interesting biology, as Alan described, I won't repeat all this, is that now that we know more about how the FA pathway holds hands with other pathways in the body, we're, we now are, have learned quite a bit about these aldehyde dehydrogenases and the mutations that can influence them, and it all fits together. Uh, Aldea Pharmaceuticals has been touched on both by Rabin and by Alan, so uh, I won't spend a lot of time on this. Their initial, uh, initial they're a small development phase biotechnology biopharmaceutical company. One of their first compounds, as Alan DeAndrea said, was an agonist or an uh, enhancer or a compound that speeds up ALDH1 for acute ethanol toxicity or Asian flushing syndrome, as Alan was describing. And they didn't think this was particularly good for us. But I'm hearing from people at the meeting today that they realize uh, we are a big, important group, and they're redirecting some of their own medicinal chemistry efforts to come up with a second generation compound that might be particularly good for uh, Fanconi. So I show you this slide in case you want to do some searches and learn what we do as fast as we do. An, Aldea has a nice website, and uh, uh, although I have not spoken with the CEO, uh, William Yelly, uh, uh, others here have, and we're hoping to have a nice relationship with these folks. Here's, 
Here's that Asian flushing syndrome slide that Alan showed. He and I must use the same internet. I don't know about that. <laughs> and Rabin, of course, just talked about the N-acetylcysteine trial. It looks like it, there, if you're interested in enrolling, uh, be thinking about it now, and actions would be necessary on your part late this year for a, for a start date in uh, January of 2015, if I read his slide correctly. There may be help for squamous cell carcinoma coming from the big guys, coming from the major pharmaceuticals. I would have, I am surprised that we didn't try this sooner, but the major pharmaceuticals are now noticing that if one interferes with the usual host protective signal on most tissues, most normal tissues in the body, it will help unleash a T cell response against a tumor. So in this slide, I depict a normal cell, which expresses a protein, P PDL1, and the net effect of that signal when it's, um, when it's detected by a cytotoxic T cell is, please calm down, don't kill me. I'm part of you, I'm the host, leave me alone. The insight here was to develop a drug that reduced this signal with the hope that the, the cytotoxic T cell would target a tumor cell. Notice how the tumor cell is skillfully rendered by the artist to look really menacing and mean. That's actually not a really accurate depiction. Tumor cells look mostly like normal cells, but this one looks mean. So the intention seems to work. And the big guys are pursuing it like mad. Bristol-Myers Squibb, AstraZeneca, Pfizer, Merck, and others are all participating in this. It's wonderful. One of them has already tested a, a, a PD-1 inhibitor on head and neck cancer with encouraging results. So terms to stay, stay uh, on top of this, here are some search terms. Other slides also have search terms. This will be, uh, I believe Teresa may have copies of these slides. So if you wish to learn more about many of the topics I've presented, you can look for search terms and uh, learn from the internet what's going on. But this is totally unanticipated to me, even though we've known about these, um, these signaling systems for some time. Finally, knowing that you, that you folks are particularly, um, have every reason to be extremely interested in what we're talking about today, you may be interested, you, you'll be thinking more and more about clinical trials. In particular, uh, when I've often, when I have been um, asked for, uh, to give advice in the past, it, sometimes it's from patients without FA but other disorders, and they say, I want a trial for my child. And we might call this an N of one trial. Here are some of the things to keep in mind. I'm neither for this or against it, but you folks are knowledgeable. Please keep some of these ideas in mind. Doctors can already prescribe a, an approved drug for a new indication. This is called off-label use. They can't, of course, approve a non, um, but, but they can't approve an investigational drug. They don't have access to it. It can only come from a drug company. The Food and Drug Administration does have a mechanism set up for single patient studies. So you and a cooperative physician can try an investigational drug. Sounds great. Getting the investigational drug may be tough, but the Food and Drug Administration is willing to help. Uh, but please keep in mind, if you do find a cooperative physician who's willing to describe a single patient study to the FDA for an off-label test of an existing drug, there are some risks and some benefits. You must balance the possible value to a patient with the possibility of serious side effects. Please recall what I said about the rationale for phase one, phase two, and phase three trials. It's safety first. There, 
a physician will be concerned about professional liability. What if it, things don't turn out well and uh, they're afraid of a lawsuit? To a, a parent must also consider the cost and the potential emotional upheaval involved. The manufacturer, particularly of an investigational drug, may be concerned that if there is a bad outcome, it, it, it could influence subsequent actions, approval, for example, from the Food and Drug Administration. Our friends in the insurance industry, insurance companies may say no to any off-label use, and they usually say no to experimental drugs. Uh, I, on, I tell you this only because there will be many more clinical trials coming forward. You'll be thinking about these questions. You can find out more about how the FDA can be helpful here via the uh, URL I present at the bottom of the slide. So there is a process there if you're interested. And I want to conclude and simply say thanks to the other folks at the Research Fund who helped me review proposals, and thank you all for your time.